Uh, good evening, everyone. It's 6.30, so I think we should begin. Um, my name is James Warren. I'm chair of the Faculty Board of Classics, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you uh, to the second of this term's webinars from the Faculty of Classics here in Cambridge. Um, as we get going, um, we uh, will be able to provide uh, a transcript, closed captions of the webinar. Um, I think you should be able to turn this on if it's not automatically on for you and you would like to see subtitling. If you go to the bottom of the screen, there should be a button that says something like live transcript and you can turn it on. Also during um, the discussion, um, please type any questions you have into the Q&A that's again available on the bottom of your screen. And after our two participants, our two discussants have, have finished the conversation between themselves, I will then be able to um, put your questions to them for the last 15, 20 minutes of the session. So without further ado, let me introduce you to uh, the two panelists for this evening. Um, first of all, it's a real pleasure to introduce you to a member of the faculty who joined us at the very beginning of this term. That's Dr. Shushma Malik who is uh, assistant professor in classics and a specialist in ancient history. She's also um, the inaugural Onassis Classics Fellow at Newnham College, so it's a real pleasure to have her with us. And she's going to be joined um, by Professor Ingo Gildenhart, who's professor of classics in the classical tradition and a fellow of King's College. And they're going to be talking to us about Nero. And I think, Shushma, you're going to begin. So I'll hand over to the two of you and I'll be back to chair discussions in about 40 minutes time. Thank you very much, uh, James, and, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, and wonderful to be able to present to you all um, something that I've been working on or have worked on for a while now, um, the Emperor Nero. He was um, the subject of my PhD thesis, so this is just a little bit of an insight into some of the things that I've, I've discovered from working on Nero, as it were, but I'm going to talk to you for about 20 minutes or so, and then um, uh, Ingo and I will have a, a chat about some of the themes that arise, hopefully, from, um, from the presentation. So um, I shall share my screen and begin. Okay, good. Um, and I hope everyone can see a shared screen. That's good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So um, I wanted, to, like I say, to talk to you a bit about an emperor who I think is often very familiar to people. Um, certainly when I say I work on Nero or to students or sort of members of my family and, and so forth, um, they have a, already a bit of an idea of who he is, either through the you know novels they might have read or bits of work they might have done at university or, um, or just actually through sort of film references and that sort of thing, because he does tend to get about, as it were, in a uh, popular culture as well as in the scholarly um, tradition. <clears throat> so just to, to make sure we're all on the same page, um, the Nero that uh, we know, as it, as it were, um, is the fifth emperor of Rome. So he is um, the fifth of the first dynasty, um, the Julio-Claudians. Um, he is a descendant of Augustus, the first of those emperors, and he is reigning from um, AD 54 to 68, so in the, in the middle of the century. Um, he has just under 14 years reigning, so he does um, have quite a long time to establish his uh, particular personality as an emperor. However, he did become emperor very young at the age of 16. So I think that's often something we forget when we hear about all the stories that, that happen about Nero, but uh, um, certainly that's um, a, a teenager emperor um, for the first time. <clears throat> um, he is well known as a um, as a murderer, um, particularly um, in terms of his family. Um, our sources talk of him killing his mother, Agrippina the Younger, um, his stepbrother Britannicus, and two um, of his wives, his two first wives, um, Octavia, who was formerly his stepsister, and Poppea as well in a particularly brutal scene. <clears throat> 
Um, but alongside that characterization of the murderousness, particularly in relation to his family, but in terms of wider Rome as well, you know, senators had to had to watch their step and so forth. Um, we also have the idea of Nero as an actor and um, an actor on the stage and also a charioteer and a sort of patron for the arts in a much more direct way than someone like Augustus, who is, of course, um, famous for being a patron of the arts. But um, Nero is on the stage rather than just funding poetry and um and 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 so forth um and part of that characterization means that he is thought of as someone who um was uh, loved greek culture a hellenophile um and while to us that might seem like a wonderful thing to be i'm uh, you know i'm sure many of us are too um for for the romans uh, for those cr critics of nero i should say being a hellenophile meant that he had divided loyalties essentially so perhaps um he spent a bit too much time looking at the east of the empire or greece in particular and not enough time ruling in rome um, perhaps two of the most famous things that people know Nero for, though, are the fire that happens in uh, 64, um, AD 64. Um, he is accused of setting fire to Rome. That's dubious. Um, I don't think I believe that um, particularly. But uh, but certainly there was a huge fire um, during his his reign, and that was a significant kind of you know cultural memory. It, it transformed into the cultural memory of Rome, and something that is very much associated with him. The aftermath, though, of that fire is um, what we now call the first persecution of the Christians. So, um, of course, that's an anachronistic um, uh, claim, but it's um, the first time we sort of get a, rec a recording of an, an emperor in Rome um, killing Christians. And, and this is tied to the fire because Christians were scapegoated, according to our source Tacitus, which I'll, I'll return to in a minute. Um, for um for having set the fire nero is trying to divert the blame from himself and um scapegoats scapegoats a group um who called themselves christians and the resulting um penalty that they pay the gruesome death is um now referred to as a, as a persecution um he lasts till the age of 31 so um again still very young really um, and it falls out of favour with uh, Rome and, and the Senate in particular, of course, but also the Praetorian Guard, and, and they decide that actually there's a better prospect in a, in a general named Galba, and in, um, in 68 um, AD, he uh, decides that, that um, he can no longer uh, remain as emperor, and he takes his own life with the help of um, his freedman Epaphroditus. So that's a kind of Nero in a nutshell, as it were. Um, that's the literary depiction. That's what our histories and things and things um, tell us. But I just wanted also to remind you that kind of on the other side of that, there's the image of the emperor, the image that people would see, those who perhaps aren't hearing all of the rumours from the imperial court or who are getting a much more official transcript of, of information. You know, his mother was conspiring against him, therefore he had to, um, had to take the action that he did, those sorts of stories. Um, there, there's also a huge number of people in the empire who would have recognized Nero through his image. Um, and these are just three examples that I, I picked, um, a, a, you know, a, a bust that we're very used to, a coin, but also um, Nero being crowned by his mother from um, an imperial cult temple in, in modern day Turkey, Aphrodisias. Um, and just to give you a sense that actually he looks very much like a lot of the other Julio Claudians. <laughs> um, sometimes, and, and the point, you know, this is part of the point, it's difficult to pick between them. Um, this coin here is perhaps the slight um, um, uh, difference because he does like to depict himself with much fuller um, uh, head and, and neck than perhaps someone like Augustus. But um, certainly these are... Uh, parts of imperial iconography that people would have seen and not necessarily been surprised by if you're walking past um you know in aphrodisias and you saw uh, an emperor in military uniform you know and that's that sort of thing then perhaps you wouldn't be so surprised and perhaps you wouldn't associate this with someone who was an actor on stage um, but what I want to focus on today in particular, so that's that's kind of the different different images, some different images of Nero. But the particular thing that has, I think I, I would argue, has influenced the way we understand him more than anything else, I think, is his Christian reception. 
So um, this story of the first persecution, um, whom we, which we have through Tacitus, Tacitus's annals, um, and then how that transforms into, alongside all of those things we've just been talking about of his um, biography, um, it transforms into an idea that Nero um, could represent the Antichrist in early Christian literature. So uh, by which I mean the beast in Revelation, um, the man of lawlessness in two Thessalonians and um, so forth. I'll talk about that in more detail very soon. But the, the main thing that, that I wanted to draw out today was how that happens. How can Nero go from being a sort of archetypal tyrant, which we're sort of you know getting familiar with from, from our biographies of, of Roman emperors, to someone who played a role in um, an, a, an apocalyptic landscape in early Christian texts. So that's what I wanted to, to take us through today. I do have some, some long quotations. I won't read them all out for sake of time, but um, I have hopefully highlighted some bits that are particularly useful. And I'm sure many of you will be familiar with these already in any case. Um, so the story we have of, of Nero's persecution of the Christians, um, as I was sort of summarising before, um, there had been a fire in Rome. Nero is accused of not taking it seriously through rumour, at least. He sung the destruction of Troy while it was happening instead of helping. Um, Tacitus then goes on to say he does help, just as a caveat. But um, um, the most important bit is that there were rumours spreading that perhaps Nero had set fire to Rome himself, primarily because um, he takes such pleasure in the rebuilding of the city, um, including his famous palace, which um, is perhaps a political misstep, but I won't I won't go into that today. Um, so while these rumours were spreading in order to, to stop them, uh, Nero substituted as culprits, Tacitus tells us, um, a, a class of men loathed for their vices whom the crowd styled Christians. Um, and But really it's the punishment of these people that is um, so vivid and so uh, so brutal in Tacitus's account. Um, you can see the, the bits in bold. They were covered uh, with wild beast skins, torn to death by dogs, or they were fastened on crosses, and when daylight failed, were burnt to serve as lamps at night. Um, these are incredibly vivid images that are made all the worse with, with what comes next, which is Nero riding as a charioteer around the gardens while this is taking place. Um, and Tacitus even adds sort of at the end of his account that, um, uh, that there was a, almost a sentiment of pity for these people who had previously been, been loathed, as he says, um, due to the impression that they were being sacrificed not for the welfare of the state, but to the ferocity of a single man. Um, now, this account, um, Tacitus's account, is becomes very important in, in the understanding of Nero's role as the first persecutor and how um, that how important an event that was in Christian history. So that's a, a very key thing to, to um, explain at this point. The other thing that comes into play when we talk about how Nero is understood as an antichrist figure in later periods is this thing that happens after he dies. So um, after he dies, there's a rumor that goes around that um, in Asia and Achaia, so in, in eastern parts of the empire, that maybe he hadn't died. Maybe he fled to the east. He was a Hellenophile. Maybe that's where he went instead. Um, and and uh, as uh, again, this uh, Tacitus tells us, um, the reports in regard to his death had been varied. So some people imagined that he was still alive. And then someone pops up, um, perhaps a slave from Pontus or a freedman from Italy, Tacitus says, who was very skilled in the ways that Nero was skilled, playing the kithara and singing. Um, and uh, that led to a belief that this was Nero and whoever this was also looked a bit like Nero. So um, this person took advantage of that, um, according to our sources, and builds some followers and, and tries to go to Rome to sort of reclaim the throne, as it were. Um, it is dealt with very quickly, however, the um, the Roman army are on it and uh, people stationed nearby uh, come, um, you know, 
uh, come and deal with this as the Roman army deals with things. Um, so you can just see at the end of this quotation, they captured the pretender's ship and killed him, whoever he was. His body, which was remarkable for its eyes, hair and grim face, was carried from Asia, uh, was carried to Asia and from there to Rome. Um, so there's sort of a, a um, it's a bit of a macabre story, actually, because there's sort of a visual proof um, at the end of it that uh, that Nero, um, that this is a false Nero. And in Rome, they can see that this is not Nero and it's all dealt with very quickly. Um, so in Tacitus, it's, it's quite clear that this is not Nero. But this kind of story, the ambiguity about whether Nero died and what happened to him, gets transformed into a sort of resurrection narrative in later um, Christian history. Nero may have died, but he may come back. And, and this is a, um, a quite a compelling part of, of, of the story as well. Um, so when we really start to get the idea that of Nero be becoming an antichrist figure is in around the third century, the third century AD. Um, and uh, this is, I, I think, probably one of the earliest or earliest extant um, uh, Christian texts that it names Nero as the Antichrist. Um, and you can see here why um, Commodian, this poet, has done so. Um, so he's, uh, his, he was in command of a kingdom. Um, his body had then been preserved for many years. He shall return from the dead. It has been revealed to us that this is Nero, who had flogged Peter and Paul in the city. In the hidden places at the very end of the world, he shall return since he was reserved for these things. Um, and so this is another aspect of the story we have here. The shall return is sort of, you know, reminding us perhaps a bit of the false Nero story. But Peter and Paul being flogged in the city, as it were, has only just really entered the, the story. So in around the second century, um, there starts to emerge an idea that in that persecution of the Christians, not only were ordinary Christians, as it were, killed, but um, St. Peter as well was part of that persecution, and Paul had been beheaded during Nero's reign as part of a separate, um, separate trial, but nevertheless under the auspices of Nero. Um, and Eusebius, again, he's a little bit later than Commodian, but um, uh, writing under Constantine in the fourth century, but really demonstrates how part of, how much this has become a part of the, the story. So um, uh, even though he doesn't talk about Nero as the Antichrist, incidentally, he does, he is very clear that uh, Peter and Paul were in Rome um, under Nero and suffered under Nero. So Paul was beheaded in Rome itself and that Peter likewise was crucified under Nero. Um, as we sort of head through our, our sources, we're moving kind of now into the later um, into into the later third century and into the fourth century. Um, the story starts to flesh out a little bit. So um, Lactantius, um, who's a North African writer, um, writing under uh, sort of in the early early fourth century, um, writes about um, the deaths of persecuting emperors. So you can imagine that this is quite a, a loaded text in in lots of ways. And he does start, of course, with Tiberius and the death of Christ, but that's a very short um, bit of his book because, um, of course, it's a, a it's it's a slightly different emperor um, relationship there. Um, he he does give us more detail, however, about Nero, and he identifies him as you can see here as the first persecutor. Um, so. Some crazed men believe, he says, some deliri, he doesn't believe it, but he reports this in any case, um, that Nero had been born away and kept alive. And so since he was the first persecutor, he may also be the last and herald the arrival of the Antichrist. It is not right to believe this, Lactantius says. Um, however, people do, as he as he goes on to say, um, and um, and that the belief is they think that Nero too will come as the forerunner and herald of the devil when he comes to lay waste um, to lay waste the earth and overturn the human race. Um, so again, there's slippage here. You'll have noticed forerunner of the Antichrist. Is he? Is he? Um, is he the forerunner of the devil? Um, these sorts of slippages take place. But the idea of the apocalyptic role of Nero is starting to become much more firmly entrenched. And even though Lactantius doesn't believe it, he reports this as something that people believe. Um, he seems to think it's significant enough to talk about. <laughs> 
Um, and another example of this, but this time from sort of the Greek tradition rather than the Latin one, it's, it's more prevalent in the Latin, but there are some Greek sources as well. Um, John Chrysostom writes in a homily on um, a letter that's written, was thought then to be written by Paul. We now are a little bit more skeptical about that. Um, or, uh, his homily on two Thessalonians. Um, when he's talking about a line in it, um, he says, for the mystery of lawlessness doth already work. Um, and then that's the line from two Thessalonians. John then says, he, meaning Paul, speaks here of Nero as if he were a type of antichrist. And just so you can see, this is the bit from two Thessalonians. And um, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself um, against every so-called God or object of worship and so forth. Um, so that's really sort of how these this is building up. Um, it, Nero is understood to be there in the Bible um, by some of these scholars, and um, particularly um, John Chrysostom here. Um, I'm more dubious as to whether these writers did write Nero into the Bible. I'm just going to say that right now. But, um, but certainly that's what people in these later periods did think. A few more examples, then I know I'm running out of time, so I'll move on a little bit more quickly. But um, Sulpicius Severus is a, a fifth century, um, what we would call a historian, really. He's writing chronicles um, and again talks about Nero as um, actually not even the worst of kings, um, but he was the basest of all men. The first persecution comes up again and the idea that he will be there immediately before the Antichrist. And at the end of this passage, he quotes both Revelation, Nero as um, the first beast in Revelation, who is wounded um, and has a mortal wound, and two Thessalonians. So the mystery of lawlessness is put in there at the end as well. So these writers are reading Nero back into the earliest Christian texts to establish him as part of an ongoing tradition, um, which I am skeptical about, but uh, that's certainly what they're doing. Um, so this um, is the bit from Revelation that uh, Sulpicius Severus is, um, is talking about. We have uh, the mortal wound, but also the number is 666. And this is going to become important as well, because numerology in various ways will dictate that Nero can fit into 666. Other people can too. And, you know, I'm sure um, people have come across all sorts of different theories of, of how 666 can work. But, but Nero was inserted as one of them. Um, and also a 616, so because there are two numerical traditions here, um, there's, there's a, a sort of manuscript um, a, a, a distinction in, in around the second century over whether it's 666 or 616. But this Donatist writer writing in the fifth century um, uh, of the Liber Genealogus, um, the Book of Genealogies, um, talks about Nero, whose name John called in the Apocalypse 616. And, and this writer comes up with a different way to get that number from those who had been coming up with 666 before. Um, actually, uh, what he does, or she, actually, I don't know, um, takes the word antichristus, um, A is one, B is two, and so forth, and then times, is, times it by four, which is the number of letters in Nero's name. So it's a little bit of a slippery um, way to do it, but that's how this author does it. Um, and what I wanted to stress at this point before moving on to some of the reception side of things is that um, while the first persecution and the false Nero's are clearly a theme that's running through this, what made Nero so attractive as an antichrist figure? Because, you know, we've got other persecutors, of course, um, other people that could, could um, occupy this role, as it were. Um, is also the completeness of his biography of in his biography of the sins he committed, if we put it in Christian terminology, of the of the tyranny, of the um, murderousness, but also of sexual immorality and promiscuity and and so forth. That all gets taken up into the way of characterizing him as the Antichrist. So he's a murderer of his own mother. He also marries a man, um, Pythagoras, um, with the with Pythagoras be acting as the man in the marriage um, and um, and so forth. So the same author, Sulpicius Severus, who we saw before talking about Nero as the Antichrist, brings in all of these things from his biography, um, from Nero's sort of pagan biography, as it were, to, to shore up this idea of Nero as the Antichrist. <laughs> 
What I find particularly interesting, though, in five minutes, is um, that Nero is um, this this idea isn't just one that comes from antiquity or stays in antiquity. It gets picked up again in the 19th century in quite an interesting sort of way. So the, the one of the earliest texts that I've managed to um, sort of identify as really picking up strongly on this late antique idea of Nero as the Antichrist is actually um, Ernest Renan, who writes a, he's a, you may have come across him before, philosopher, theologian of, of, of the French school. Um, he writes a seven volume history of Christianity, of which volume four is called Antichrist and is entirely about Nero. Um, and this is just a little snippet. I won't read it out um, at all, but um, the bit, first bit is, is uh, evocative enough. The name for Nero has been found. It shall be the beast. Nero shall be the Antichrist. Um, and then he goes on and ties in aspects of Nero's biography into, into how this is going to, to work. One thing I will very quickly flag is, is Ernest Renan is doing something very interesting here. He's not saying that actually that Nero will come back as the Antichrist. He's saying almost near, we've already lived under an Antichrist with Nero. So it's a different kind of um, apocalyptic sort of, uh, yes, a, a different kind of apocalyptic story. Um, this is, so Ernest Renan is one thing. I mean, he will have had his readers, but not necessarily everyone in the bookstore is going to rush to his work. Um, far more widespread, though, in terms of its popularity, was um, a novelist and the Dean of Canterbury, um, Frederick William Farrer, who wrote a two-volume um, novel on Nero called Darkness and Dawn, or Scenes from the Days of Nero, in 1891, um, complete with end notes. It's uh, that kind of historical novel. Um, but it is an incredibly interesting read if you if you um get, get can get your hands on it um and he writes in his um in in the introduction to his um, in, in introduction to his novel you know as everyone does um that he had intended to write this as a a, a defense of christianity on the historic side so this is about people understanding properly um, who the, the Antichrist is. It's not someone who's existed since Nero. It's not the Pope, as many other people were saying in this period, um, you know, the, uh, with, the, with the rise of Anglo-Catholicism. It's Nero. Remember your history. Remember it's Nero. That's his way of, of um, contributing to this battle. Um, and in it, there's some wonderful kind of license taken. It's a novel, of course, so he can do this, but he makes Britannicus and Octavia, you know, they're Nero's victims in Tacitus and, and Suetonius. Um, he makes them Christian. So that's his way of, of kind of weaving in the, the narrative of the family and the brutality of Nero is not just against its, his family, it's against his Christian family, um, which makes the resonance all the more um, uh, sort of stark. Um, and again, he, he pictures the apocalypse, Nero's reign as an apocalyptic reign, to the point that he places John, who wrote the apocalypse, according to Christian tradition, in Rome. And that's that's sort of new. Paul is known to be in Rome, but John um, is not necessarily thought to be in Rome or writing under Nero. But he does that. Um, he pictures it there. So um, the wild beast who sprang up from the foul scum of the world's most turbid sea, John got that image from watching Nero's reign. Um, not everyone was a fan of Farah, for obvious re for some reasons. Um, uh, but Farah's, but Farah's um, basic premise, that story, that story of the Nero as the antithesis of everything that is Christian and is good, um, really does take off. So the sign of a cross is another uh, play of this period, 1895 by Wilson Barrett, that has a very similar storyline. And similarly, uh, Quo Vardis, which I'll come back to in just a second. Um, but I wanted to give you this rather amusing um, review from the Saturday Review of Literature and Politics of the sign of the cross by Wilson Barrett, where, um, you know, he's, he says this is plagiarized. Um, it's plagiarized um, by, um, uh, by Wilson Barrett. It's essentially Darkness and Dawn, um, but the author of Darkness and Dawn is outdone even by, um, by Wilson Barrett. Um, and uh, the way that you, you write a good history these days, or sorry, a good story these days is um, uh, you take down one or two common handbooks of Latin history. You copy out what it said about, let us say, Nero. You then consult an authority on Roman upholstery and dress and take some notes on some agreeable articles and garments. 
Then being thus amply supplied with local color and a few Latin words, you let the genius of Christianity have her fling, tincturing the whole thing with a kind of broad, tepid sentiment, which experience has taught you is most welcome on the Saturday nights at the back of the pit. Before you know it, and to your equal pleasure and surprise, your romance is written, and it is a story of Christian martyrdom under Nero, and you call upon the clergy to shudder and approve. So a rather brutal review. I think if I ever got anything like that, I wouldn't be massively happy <laughs> with uh, the outcome. But um, but certainly, you know, this was a polarized, polarized response, very popular, but, um, you know, people were uh, engaging it with it in different ways. And another way to engage with it is to sort of ignore the, the sins of Nero altogether and use him as a marketing tool, which is what they did for Quo Vadis. Um, so any of you who've seen Quo Vadis, and, and it's a wonderful film, I'm sure many of you have, um, know that Nero is played by Peace to Ustinov, who does not look particularly like this <laughs> in, in, in his shorts. Um, but uh, the idea of kind of the decadence of a Roman emperor is really played up on here. You want to make like Nero in Quo Quo Vardis shorts show the uh, um, you can speed up the process by showing your empress your wife this page and so forth um, you never a poor toga clad Nero never knew the small com smart comfort of these full cut rayon boxer shorts they're in the happiest patterns you ever saw if she your wife doesn't come through go get them yourself um, so Nero is really ambiguous, is <laughs> really being played around with in this period in, in many different ways. And um, because Quo Vadis, of course, is, is written, well, it's written in, in the 1890s. Um, in the same tradition as Farrer and, and Wilson Barrett, but this is a 1950s film, and very much the idea in a post-war America is, is to, to, to kind of restart and, and rethink and, and celebrate some of the more luxurious aspects of life. In the film itself, though, you are very much reminded that Nero is the Antichrist. So um, away from selling boxer shorts, um, he is, it's also identified in the opening voiceover that um, this is the story of an immortal conflict. In the early summer of 64 AD, in the reign of the Antichrist, known to history as the Emperor Nero, the victorious 14th legion is on its way back to Rome and, and so forth. So even though Nero in Quo Vadis is very much not an antichrist figure, as those of you who've seen it will know, he's, he's you know, played as a, as a sort of comic figure almost, um, as Charles Lawton does to, to some extent in The Sign of the Cross. Um, in the voiceover, you still have in the reign of the antichrist known as Nero. Um, and away from popular culture, it, this also infiltrates the, the scholarship of the period. So when we start to get the first sort of historical biographies being written by ancient historians, and this is an example out of Oxford, Bernard Henderson in 1903, um, Nero is there as, as the beast. <laughs> Um, in, in one of the sections of his book, um, he says, uh, he, he parses almost, he explains, he interprets the, what's going on in Revelation. Um, and he says, this indubitably equals Nero, the legend of whose healing um, and return to reign was in everyone's mouth. Um, and what I, I find interesting about this is actually in the rest of his biography, he's quite sympathetic to Nero. He says at the beginning that he wants writers, uh, he wants people to understand that Nero was defamed by Flavian late, later writers, those of different dynasties, the Flavians and the Antonines. Um, Despite that, despite a relatively um, sympathetic tone in some parts of his biography, he cannot escape Nero equals the Antichrist, as, um, as Renan had revived in, in the 1870s. Um, so this then kind of has an afterlife in the way that we understand um, understand Nero. And actually, um, it's something that, that, that still infiltrates popular culture, I think, in much more subtle ways. But um, uh, when we talk about the emperor and our, our impressions of the significance of that persecution and of the fire as well. So I think I'll leave it there for the presentation and then I can um, hopefully uh, also kind of answer your questions and, and have a chat with Ingo as well. So thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you very much, Shushma, for this uh, incredibly uh, fascinating uh, presentation, rich in detail and uh, 
suggestions for Christmas presents or thrown in for good measure. So I made a note of those box of chores. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> if you find them, do let me know. <laughs> from, from what period does that date? Is that the 1950s? 1950s, yeah. 1950s, yeah 1950s. 1950s. <laughs> well, well um, I mean, one of the, the, the great pleasures um, of um, uh, this presentation of, of your work in general um, is that uh, you really uh, enable us to look into wacky corners of the classical world and its reception down to the present day. So there's sort of a, a full kind of two millennia of cultural history that we could actually talk about now. Mm -hmm. uh, and how, you know, these ideas of first arose and then sort of captured the imagination and then passed on uh, and still captivate our mind. Um, you're still thinking in terms of uh, Nero fiddled when Rome burned, etc. Et <laughs> so they're, they're still with us, uh, perhaps more so than some of the actual facts <laughs> of the ancient world. Uh, and one wonders, you know, what, what keeps the classical tradition alive? Is it more uh, sort of historical realities that no one longer cares about, or these kind of imaginative engagements that then take on a life of their own? Uh, but so my first question is sort of uh, against my own instincts, uh, I thought, uh, a, a more sort of a conservative take on, on this. Um, I mean, as the, your, your later slides already show, and if you have actually been emphasizing throughout your presentation, uh, much of the Nero that we are getting here is uh, the Nero of scandal. Uh, mm -hmm. And nowadays of ancient historians, I think would by and large agree that this is the product of a defamatory imagination and so of contemporary ancient historians, they are working hard to recover as it were the true, the authentic Nero, uh, you know, who, if he committed murder, did so because of dynastic policies, uh, fully informed by advisors that this is the right thing to do at this particular moment for strategic reasons, uh, certainly didn't put the city on flame. I mean, even Tacitus of you know, main source essentially disowns that yes. uh, while uh, sort of indulging the rumors. Uh, so perhaps I, I could invite you to uh, sort of talk a bit about how you would kind of situate your own research vis-a-vis -vis this kind of tradition of defamation uh, that, you know, we capture first in Tacitus and then carries through to the horrible histories in the BBC. Yes. No, thank you very much. Um, I think, and this is especially interesting, this question when you're teaching, because when I teach Nero, I sort of feel like I have to um, come out, like confess at the beginning of any course I teach on Nero that, um, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I don't necessarily believe that any person anywhere in any period of history is wholly good or wholly bad. I'm, I'm kind of that sort of dichotomy is um, difficult for me to imagine because, you know, from lived experience, but also just from under, understandings of, of history. So um, it's, it's very difficult, I think, to imagine that any person is wholly good or wholly bad and 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 Nero I think certainly is a mixture of both I'm I'm not someone who necessarily thinks that he is um the best emperor that ever walked <laughs> through Rome streets but on the other hand um exactly as you said you look at Augustus and the kind of um decisions from a dynastic viewpoint that he makes um is a, a very much um you know sets a precedent for these kinds of um imperial deaths um the the kind of structure of the family and and so forth and we see them continuing you know in later uh, periods as well but one of the things i think is quite interesting about nero and i think you could probably say the same of a sort of difficult emperor like caligula is part of what they're doing is playing around with what one monarchy looks like so um and this is sort of where i i think i i would come down on the, on on this question about um you know on the one hand emperors who are doing that are not going to be remembered particularly well by historians who either are looking back to the republic as tacitus sort of does as as a place of um uh, where where uh, things worked well and senators had the authority that they should have had or even someone like Cassius Dio, who's writing in, in the late second, early third century with a very different conception of monarchy because um, he has a much longer tradition in it and um, because the Principate has come so far by the time that, that he's writing. Um, Nero is really playing around with what, what
what it means to to have autocracy i think and and how far he can push that and and what um what what you can do as an emperor and what you can't do as an emperor and something like getting up on stage you could see as a sort of progression of the performativity of what an emperor is already so an emperor performs in Rome when he um, goes to the theatre, uh, sorry, to the games and is seen by particular people. He performs in Rome when um, with imperial triumphs or whatever it might be. Um, this is a this is a way of perhaps doing that in a much more outright, um, controversial, pushing the boundaries kind of way um, that suited his, his personality. But um, certainly, I think the more um, nuanced readings of some of the texts that we have, and, and again, this is where I think sort of material evidence is so important, because especially when we think of Nero as the Antichrist, while we might consider what even 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 if we were to believe everything Tacitus said, right, even if we were to do that, that's still very much a imperial central picture it's what people in Rome would have seen in in the wider empire how many of those rumors really got round how many people understood um the figure of the emperor in that way how many people cared is another question um of course but uh but certainly I think um when we think about figures like that that the it's important to remember that there are probably like a lot of different interpretations of them you, we can think of a modern, po I won't go into the modern politics, but we can think of modern politicians and realise how differently people can view um, the same actions. And, and it's, a, it's, it's something that we also see run through, I think, um, some of the issues with Nero. Uh, thank you for that. The uh, 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 sort of question from a slightly different angle uh, that I've been pondering when I <clears throat> uh, sort of was reading your work and listening to you. I mean, you explored the chronological boundaries of classics, you know, by taking classics out of antiquity into uh, sort of the following centuries down to the present uh, with your reception angle. But at the same time, you also explored disciplinary boundaries in the study of the ancient world arguably trespassing on territory uh, that yes. uh, scholars in uh, theology or religious studies or as it is still quaintly called in Cambridge divinity uh, would consider their terrain uh, and I'm wondering whether you could share some impressions of how your work has been received sort of uh, from the other side as it were <laughs> from the other side of that gulf that tends to separate classics which is really sort of a discipline grounded in sort of secular impulses, mm. secular foundations from uh, sort of the uh, more sort of religiously oriented scholarship that goes on in, in other faculties. Yes, no, thank you. Um, and I'm not going to lie, I was terrified about it when I did it. <laughs> um, when you sort of, you know, as a PhD student, you think, oh, the world is open to you and, you know, you can do whatever you like. And then you sort of realise, oh, you're, you're not really supposed to do that. You're kind of supposed to be a little bit more careful. Um, and, and I was careful. I did sort of... Um, have a lot of dialogues with people in 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 those faculties so sort of send work or present i presented at patristics conferences and a new testament seminar series and and so forth and and just to make to make sure that i wasn't sort of you know doing doing any sort of bits of interpretation in, in a way that that didn't resonate with um ways that they might um might understand as 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 relevant and and important um what i would say though is that and i would say this to to them as well um i am i'm coming at this from a historical perspective i think these are um these texts are so fascinating because it's it's um so easy to forget that the Bible, I mean, we intellectually know that the Bible is written in, in the Roman Empire, right? But sometimes there can be a disconnect between the types of literature that we associate with the Roman Empire and that that we associate with, with theology. And, and actually, the cultural context of these things are contexts we as historians know. We know what um, uh, literature from Asia Minor looks like. We know about the Greek novel. We know about all sorts of things that that you know, aren't necessarily what these texts are doing, but they are informing the cultural landscape of, of, of these texts. Um, so I thought it was really important to 
look back because all the work, really all the work that had been done since Henderson on, on this had been done by in theologians, rather, New Testament scholars, rather than by historians. And while a lot of that work was incredibly interesting and gave me a great foundation on which to build, their understanding of Nero wasn't the kind of understanding that ancient historians had in, you know, currently have now and, and you know, um, have had for sort of um, a, a few, a number of years now. Um, so I thought it was worth revisiting that from a, a perspective of history and seeing what we can do with it, seeing what, um, what how the outcomes are different and I think they were different and and um I'm very lucky that I've had some uh really lovely feedback from um from from theology I was um fortunate enough to be in uh, have have my book the subject of a reading group in America um for um on redescribing Christian origins project which is um a wonderful thing run by two fantastic um associate professors uh Robin Walsh and Sarah Rollins in in America and um they yeah, so so they gave me huge amounts of, of incredible feedback and, and really engaged with the ideas and, you know, picked me up on some things and but also um, very much were willing to we're, were, were really willing to kind of do that kind of cross disciplinary cross cultural work. So I've been very lucky in that respect. Thank you for that on, on the notion of dialogue. Um... James, are you there? I'm kind of slightly <laughs> conscious of time. Ah, here you are. Yes, now I'm back. Slightly yeah, conscious you. of time, and I yeah. want to deprive our audience from yeah, good. being able to so, jump into um, the dialogue. Thank you. So please, if I can just encourage people to uh, add any questions they would like to in the Q&A box. Um, those that we don't get round to uh, uh, answering this evening, we can um, save, and perhaps Shushma and Ingo will, might um, be able to answer them uh, separately. Um, so let me start with um, someone from the chat who's, who's kind of bringing the reception of Nero right up to the present and in an interesting kind of pedagogical fashion. Mm -hmm. So the question is, have you seen the way that Emperor Nero is presented in the Suburani Latin textbooks? I don't know if you're aware of these uh, Latin textbooks. No, no, I don't do know. Do you have those any ones. comments about that presentation? I mean, it just strikes me as interesting that, that that would be a kind of context for presenting uh, uh, mm. language learning against, against the backdrop of, of, of a character like Nero. I mean, mm. where, where, where have you have you seen have you got any thoughts on his presentation in kind of educational contexts in terms of schools and um, other kinds of, uh, of of textbook kind of material? Yes, no, thank you very much. I'm not familiar with that book. I apologise. Um, I will go and have, check it out <laughs> afterwards. But uh, but and can certainly write a write a response. But um, I know. I mean, I, I I was teaching from the Cambridge Latin course grammar book today. Um, some some preliminary prelim Latin students, and they were not big fans of Domitian, <laughs> the writers of that that book. So I I understand the idea where so you know these kinds of ideas of emperors slip into into um textbooks like Latin books and 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 so forth um I think because uh, I have done um I I have uh, I gave a um a present I present presented a, a number of schools who have sort of classical associations or societies that are attached to them and and um or run you know special seminars for their students um particularly in London so in Hammersmith and in Camden and um and in Channing School as well which is in in North London and and it's been really wonderful because a a lot of the time um the syllabuses can be particularly in respect to Nero so the um the imperial image syllabus and um and then the Nero and the Julio Claudians in the imperial image they look at Augustus and then for Nero and the Julio Claudians it's very much focused on um well, on 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 literature, there is far less engagement with um from from what I understand of the syllabus and what the teachers have told me with the material culture. So when I've gone and given presentations about um the different sort of images of Nero that we get if we go wider in the empire, if we look at places like Greece, if we if we read that he once had his name inscribed on the Parthenon and and so forth, that there can be different ways of 
interpreting imperial power and different ways of understanding emperors as you know is uh, people are already doing in relation to Augustus I think Nero gets less of that treatment because it's sort of understood um perhaps in a in a, a as a more straightforward case um so I think uh, yeah, one of the, the things that I've often come across is that um, the, the focus on the literature, of course, gives you a particular slant on things, but they have been very, very kind of receptive to, to the widening out of this. And I've been, again, very um, lucky to be able to work with some of those schools um, on this. And, and um, in Australia as well, actually, I, I did a bit of work with a teacher in Australia. Um, I, I worked there for a few years, but this was afterwards. This was quite recently. Um, uh, on on some students who were writing extended projects on Nero and and uh, were were interested in sort of widening the the range of, of 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 evidence. So I think in in that way, there's some really great work going on in schools at the moment to address those sorts of issues. Mm. But of course, it's it's um you know we're still ca everyone's still catching up on on all sorts of things right. in scholarship. So, um, so a, a, a couple more questions. I mean, is there anything to be said in favour of Nero? I mean, is is there <laughs> Do you find a kind of positive tradition for him as well? And and I wonder whether you might sort of con you might say something a bit more about his Hellenophilia that you yes. you talked about earlier on, because that is something that later emperors take up. Absolutely. I wonder whether even they too might have thought of themselves as sort of reviving something of a Neronian attitude, or was or was that sort of something you would avoid even implying? Um, it's so an excellent question. I, I think um, Hadrian is normally the emperor that sort of strikes people as the most sort of Nero-like in, in, and that's partly to do with his depiction. So I, I suppose the thing we need to be careful of is with literature in any case, that often these biographies are sort of shaped around particular parameters that mean um, sort of stories uh, are told about emperors in particular ways when, when they're seen to be sort of in relation to each other. Um, Hadrian is, of course, ultimately remembered, I, I think, as, as a good emperor. Um, Edward Gibbon doesn't, which is slightly interesting, but I won't, I won't go into that. <laughs> he is quite relevant, but uh, sorry, quite prolific. But, um, but certainly, I think uh, that aspect of the Hellenophilia, you can absolutely kind of reimagine a biography of Nero through the perspective of of um, of Greece. Um, he frees uh, the province of Achaia from taxation, and there is a huge, um, in, well, there's, there's an inscription put up to this in, in various places. Um, Nero is hailed as, as someone who is freeing Greece. He is, um, he's equated to Zeus and, and Apollo and so forth in positive ways rather than in the negative ways we might assume that would happen in Rome. Um, and and um, yeah, so certainly if you were painting a picture of him from that perspective, your picture would be very different indeed. Um, the, and, and it's such a symbolic move as well, because actually the freeing from taxation meant not so much in a fiscal sense, but in a symbolic sense, it, it was incredibly um, uh, in, uh, important um, in, in, and commemorated as, as such. On coinage as well, that we get the same kind of vocabulary being used on, on provincial coins too. Um, so I think if you took different perspectives on Nero, particularly that Hellenophile one, you could certainly write a different story of him. Um, but not only in that way, um, in in the um, what we would I guess call the Renaissance, um, uh, Girolano Cardano wrote a, a um, encomium to Nero based on ideas of, of astrology and various things that meant that Nero was a good man um, and and sort of reimagined it in, in, in those ways. I haven't read it in a while. I'll have to reread it and, and um, uh, talk about it a bit more. But, um, but there have been certainly um, ways of doing this. I will just add very quickly, the other slightly subversive way of seeing Nero as a good emperor is if you twist what you think is good and bad if you sub completely uh, invert and um, well, not completely but I'm thinking of the decadent movement so in the sort of fin de siècle 19th mm. century um kind of uh, uh literary and an artistic um environment of Paris and London and so forth someone like Oscar Wilde deliberately had his hair cut like Nero to be a little bit kind of you know edgy and subversive and and Nero is the ideal um you know o along with someone like Elagabalus as well but the ideal of what and when you have all the power what you can do with art and that's another way to <laughs> reframe Nero slightly as well.
Good. So um, some more questions. I mean, someone wants, I think you you earlier on referred to your approach as, as kind of principally historical. And I, I wonder whether you could say just a bit more about what that contrasts with and what the, sure. yeah. Yes, no, thank you. That's a, a great question. So I think um, the, the, what, uh, what I meant by that is um, often when Nero has been, um, been talked about before, the emphasis is on how um, sort of the, the, the first beast in Revelation or the man of lawlessness in, in, um, in, in two Thessalonians fits into the tradition of, of I, I'm using antichrist as a term, as a sort of catch-all term, it is, it, which is a little bit loose. It's the eschatological adversary. So the sort of figure that will appear at the end times. Antichrist, of course, is quite specific, but um, you could also talk about an eschatological adversary in Daniel, for example, um, pre, uh, pre-Christianity in the Old Testament. Um, and it's so often the relationship being looked at in 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 relation to sort of Nero as the Antichrist is how that fits into biblical exegesis, um, biblical interpretation. Right. So how does this relate to um, sort of scripture um, in in different traditions, and and what does this mean for for um, sort of interpretative ideas in a theological sense of what what the Antichrist is and Nero is sort of put in there as a and you know people would have thought of Nero and Nero was who John had in mind or Paul had in mind when writing um when when scholars from from New Testament studies are trying to put a bit more of a historical interpretation onto um onto revelation or onto to the two Thessalonians so it belongs to a particular mm-hmm. interpretative strand in theology that is looking for um right. a sort of historicization and um, what I mean when I say historical is um I'm I'm absolutely interested in how he fits into kind of Christian um lit- uh, tra- the Christian tradition as well but I'm also interested in in how um that that idea of him as the Antichrist fits into the wider sort of Roman um tradition and historical tradition and also trying to d- I guess problematize the idea of Nero being in the Bible with these different ways of understanding Nero. So with the different images that you get of Nero, with the different ways that you could interpret him rather than the different ways you can interpret the Antichrist. Great. And we ought to have an eye on the time, but um I think this is a a, a really interesting question. So um someone in the chat asks, what difference to the cultural understanding of Nero was made? after the rediscovery of the Domus Aurea. I mean, so do do you see particular moments of um, unearthing or discovery of sort of artistic things or monuments like that making a, a substantial difference to the way in which Nero is being conceived? Yes, thank you. That is a fantastic question and, and, and incredibly interesting. And I think I think you do to an extent. I, I'm not sure it necessarily always um, carries over in a in a I don't know in, in in a way that sort of makes a generation reinterpret, for example. So um, one of you know the, the things on the discovery of the Domus Aurea that we know is it completely changed, for example, the way that wallpaper was was made and and you know the the decorative. I think there was a, an article in the Guardian last year about the discovery of a house in Yorkshire that had Domus Aurea wallpaper. It's just it's wonderful, kind of those those things, but. What this reminds me of is the make like Nero and Quo Vadis shorts kind of thing. So it doesn't, you, these, these things can sort of coexist, but one doesn't necessarily disrupt the other, I don't think. So Nero, we know Nero is decadent. We know Nero is luxurious. We know probably Nero w- might have liked fine clothing and possibly rayon boxer shorts, um, that he had this hugely decorative um, house that people can, you know, emulate for its luxury. But But the point, I guess, of not being a Nero is that you don't do it to the extent that Nero did. So, you know, if you did, you would probably be criticised. And we I shouldn't get political, but we see that with someone like Donald Trump. So the, the pictures of him in his gold um, apartment, right, surrounded by all of all of this. And he's framing himself in that way. But that opens you up to that sort of excessive luxury discourse. Um, so people can take aspects of Neronian luxury, but without taking the whole of it and that doesn't necessarily mean a redemption of Nero what it means is sort of a picking and choosing of the bits that you think are um 
are, are, are interesting and relevant for your particular kind of decorative yeah. scheme. <laughs> Good. And just very finally, very quickly, I wonder whether you had anything to say about Nero's role in a kind of British foundational myth. So mm -hmm. the way in which Nero features as a kind of antagonist to Boudicca in in Tustus, and then that that carries through into historiography of Britain. Mm, absolutely, no. This is this is really interesting, and and I think particularly I find this quite interesting in sort of the poetry and things of the Victorian period, um, because one of the um, one uh, because Boudicca became incredibly important in the Victorian period. You know, we've got the um, on Westminster Bridge. There's the there's the statue of Boudicca that was originally done um, in this time, and and you know the story of it being put up is quite convoluted but um but it, eventually it was and the idea that Boudicca represents the um ancestor of Victoria um then gives you a very sort of complicated kind of imperial um uh, working where you've got the the you've got Nero and you might think Victoria is like Nero but no Victoria is like Boudicca um but one of the um and and certainly that's that's very important to the kind of foundational idea of, of Britain so on the one hand I should say you've got the idea that Boudicca is the um morally upstanding kind of you know victorious um uh or not victorious but but trying to um a free Britain right that's what Tacitus says um you know we want want Britain to be free um against the despotic Nero um on the other hand because of the difficulty with the imperial story in the Victorian period one of the things I find so interesting about someone like Alfred Lord Tennyson when he writes um you know about a, a, a poem about this um is that Nero becomes the um Eastern despot. So actually, the characterization of him is more like what we would expect of someone like um, Darius or Xerxes from Herodotus, rather than um, the the kind of image that we might have of a Roman emperor. Even of someone like Nero, who is a Hellenophile, they play with that, of course, but it's it's so um, sort of extreme. So again, it's it's the, the dichotomy of East and West. Um, Boudicca being the West and, and Nero being the East, which um, then, of course, is reversed with Victoria because Victoria in the West is is um, the Empress of India. So there's some some really fascinating. Fascinating. Mm. Great. Well, thank you, um, Ingo. Thank you, Shushma. Um, we could go on and on and on. <laughs> um, but and thank you all for uh, joining us this evening. Just a reminder. Um, uh, you can find out much more about various um, things we do for and with our alumni on the faculty website. Please take a look. Um, and just an invitation for you to join us again next week, I think, which will be the third and final of our webinars this term, when another of our um, new colleagues, Henry Spellman, will be joining me to talk about the, the poet and philosopher Xenophanes. So if you haven't heard anything about Xenophanes, He's one of my he's one of my faves. So do come along and listen to us there as well. But thank you again, Ingo. Thank you especially, Shushma. And good evening to everybody. <laughs>